the gentleman who was sustained a gunshot wound in late uh, March, so that's now six weeks back, uh, to the right anterior chest. You can see from the nature of the surgery, all the way down the medial arm, he said he had a vascular injury, and uh, apparently the hand surgeons were called at the time, uh, but we don't have documentation of, uh, of what injury he sustained uh, macroscopically. Uh, the important thing to note is when you get an infraclavicular gunshot wound, uh, you want to assess the brachial plexus from the nerves up. Superclavicular is from the uh, roots down. So here we're going to examine the, the terminal branch of the brachial plexus and then work upwards. So the first thing we'll start with the post report. I think it's always a good idea with these infraclaviculars um, just, to, um, just to examine deltoid and the uh, suprascapular nerve. So you can see, hold it up. You can see he's got a good bulk to deltoid. You can test his posterior deltoid and his suprascapular infraspinated. Hold it up. It's working. Otherwise, his arm will fall into interrotation. That, that tells you, yes, it is a, it is a um, uh, infraclavicular problem and it's distal to the deltoid branch, the axillary branch. But if you continue with the posterior cord, so remember, the posterior cord gives the axillary nerve and then it continues the radial nerve proper. So we look at the triceps. Keep your arm straight and, and push me away. No triceps. If we examine the next nerve down, the next muscle down is the brachioradialis. Bend up to your mouth. You can see brachioradialis contracting. So he's got some brachioradialis. If we ask him to extend his wrist, lift up. You see he does extend the wrist very weakly and he goes into radial deviation, telling us that ECRL is working, but not easy, unlikely ECRB. And ECU definitely not. We then go further, we go to the EDCs. Lift your fingers uh, straight, got no EDC function. Lift up your thumb. No EPL, no EPB, no APL function. So the, the only part of the posterior cord slash radial nerve that is working is brachioradialis and ECRL. Okay. We then move on to the median nerve. So the median nerve is, if we just start at, at the wrist level, bend up like this. So it's got no FCR. We ask him to keep it, your arm in pronation. Keep your arm, in, keep your arm turned in. Don't let me turn it out. Eh? Fight against me. Nothing. No, no pronation. Terry's contracting there. Then we move on to the uh, terminal, uh, the ARN branches, and make a fist. He's got no, no flexion of the fingers and no flexion of the thumb. Bend the thumb, and he's got no, no oh, medial nerve intrinsic, so the medial nerve is not working. When we come onto the ulnar nerve, once again, we can start with the FCU, bend up there. Nothing, maybe a flick of something on the FCU, but nothing in the long flexes, nothing in the intrinsics. When we tested sensation, he's got no sensation in the medial nerve, but he does have some deep protective sensation in, in this part of the uh, hand. He doesn't enjoy that, but that could be coming to the radial nerve. He does have sensation in the radial nerve uh, distribution. So, working from distal backwards, if we, if we know that the uh, M of the brachial plexus is there, so the artery is running there, this is the M. So this is the medial cord, lateral cord. Uh, the lateral cord continues as the musculocutaneous nerve, which, uh, sorry, I didn't document that, but you can see bend up. Got no biceps. Any attempted elbow flexion bender is through the uh, uh, breaker radialis. He doesn't have any contracting biceps. Don't, be, don't, don't make that mistake in the exam or when you assess these patients. So that's just using the, uh, the breaker radialis to flex. So the muscular cutaneous nerve is not working. The, med the lateral limb of the medial nerve, this is the medial nerve, the lateral limb of the medial nerve and the medial limb make up the medial nerve. This is, the motor function in there is pronated teres and FCR, and these are not working. The motor function coming into the medial nerve from the medial cord is all the FDSs, the FTP, uh, FTP index and middle, FPL, and, uh, the thena, and the thena muscles, and none of those are working. And then the rest of the medial cord continues as the ulnar nerve, and none of that is working. So his injury you can see if that's not working, 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 is up at this level. So it's at the cord level. The lateral cord and the medial cord are not working. And his posterior cord, which is lying behind the artery, is partially working. So that's, that's, a, that's a dash do, uh, cross. So that's partial, a partial injury to the posterior cord and a complete injury to the medial cord and the lateral cord. So that helps you work it out. If you try and do this, looking at C5, C6, C7, C8, T1, and working this way, you'll get yourself completely confused as to where the level of injury is. So we now know that this guy has got a lateral cord, medial cord, and partial posterior cord injury. Um, from a reconstructive, uh, for the postgrads now, so undergrads can sign off. From a postgrad point of view, what would we do with this guy? Well, at our unit, we tend to 
not operate on these early because most of them will recover spontaneously, a high percentage, and even if they, even those that don't, and you go for early expiration, when you get into the surgery, you often don't know what to do because you get a completely transected nerve, but you don't have the zone of injury, or you get a badly contused nerve and you don't know if it's going to recover. You're not sure whether to excise and graft it. If it's a Sunderland 4 or a Sunderland 5 or a Sunderland 3, it's often very difficult to know what to do with that. So we tend to watch them and then see what recovery we get and then reconstruct them afterwards. Reconstructive options are grafting, which is obviously difficult. It's a lot of nerves. To, your donors are your two sural nerves and your radial sensory nerve, your medial cutaneous nerve of arm and forearm. But it's a lot of nerve to graft. Plus, it's going to be a very difficult area to go into because of the previous uh, arterial injury and maybe arterial surgery or arterial grafting. So preferable to that would be to rather do nerve transfers, but to do nerve transfers you have to have something to recover. And if nothing recovers then you're going to have to go and graft his uh, proximal brachial plexus. And then uh, if he does get a fairly good recovery and protect the sensation but no motor recovery, if hopefully his posterior cord fully recovers we can do tendon transfers to give him a good hand. And the one we prefer to, to use there would be brachial radialis to the FBL to give him uh, some pinch and then ECRL to the FDPs to give him grasp. So you'll have lateral key pinch and grasp and you'll hopefully have enough uh, EDCs to release. So you'll have grasp and release. It'll be a very um, diminished hand but it'll definitely be a lot better than he's got now. But that's incumbent on the fact that the posterior cord is going to fully recover. Um, if it doesn't, well then we're probably going to have to go and do uh, a nerve grafting, which will be a very treacherous and difficult operation, but that's the only option you've got. Okay, you can see already he's burnt himself, so he's lost his protective sensation, and that's another reason to go and graft him, because the tendon transfers will never restore the sensation, they'll only restore the motor function. So that's the reconstruction for this guy down the line, but we would wait at least four to six months and monitor him for an advancing to null sign to see what's what's recovering and hopefully he starts getting pro-grade recovery so his triceps might start recovering and then his bi uh, biceps and brachialis and then we, th we know he's on the, on the uh, route to, to gradual recovery so only once he's plateaued will we consider the secondary interventions. Okay.